They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you. If you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Deaths and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size. You turn on the television or you pick up a newspaper magazine and all the information you see is just controlled by a, a handful of corporations. So how are you or I or any of us? How can we get our messages out to people? How can you tell people what you care about? You can go on Facebook and compete with uh, hundreds of people who post things that may or may or may not be true. You can go on Twitter and post things in a, with a handful of characters because Twitter is really the place for literate people to hang out. Or you could go in with a sandwich board and walk the streets. You could write a letter to the editor. Or, even better, you could go to public access television. Public access serves your community on a first come, first serve basis. And whether you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. It's first come, first served. Everyone in the community is welcome to come to public access and talk about not only the issues that are important to them, but if you have a, a poem to recite, a story to tell, a song to sing, just anything at all that's in your mind or heart to tell, you come to public access. Public access in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm speaking right now, has been around since 1980, and I've seen it change events in Fayetteville. And uh, the nice thing about public access now in the 21st century is that it's not just on a television channel, but it's also on the Internet, so you can reach people around the world. So if, you're just, if you feel frustrated, and not being able to talk to people, not being able to get your message out, and you think there's no way to do it, well, take heart, there is. Public access, it's a vital component of our First Amendment rights. So, public access, like the man says, use it or lose it. Hi, my name is Ike Mills. I'm with the American Postal Workers Union number 667 out of Fayetteville Local and we're watching Fayetteville Local Access TV. Dear Polly, this is an odd time to be writing you. Who takes time to compose a letter to someone deceased? I have, because your loss has left quite a void within me. Do you remember the discussion we had at lunch that Saturday in September, the year of your passing? You made the point that you didn't feel well and would not see Christmas. I fought hard in my mind to deny the probability. You then proceeded to lay down a detailed series of orders with regard to my responsibilities upon your passing. I was awed by how well organized and businesslike your approach was to your impending death. It was apparent you were welcoming your demise. I saw demons in your eyes.
Because my mother insisted that her cremated remains be placed with yours, you occupied a special place in my home for six years until the effects of her Alzheimer's brought you together again. I was comforted by your being there with me. We never discussed burial arrangements. I took it upon myself to arrange a military honors service for you at the National Cemetery on the Cape. The thought of you resting in a common municipal cemetery troubled me. A World War II veteran of the Bulge deserved better. Both your sons shared that sentiment. I needed the assurance that from my home, you would transition to a place that will forever be pristine and allow you to rest with honor among your peers. During the short 30-minute service, it felt as though the eyes of the entire country were focused on you. It's a shame you weren't able to awaken long enough to witness that tribute. Hi, with us today is Douglas Andonian, who has produced two films, uh, Sons of War and Silent Quarry. Yep. And uh, you live in Goshen, but you've traveled all around the world. And uh, I guess we'll talk about Sons of War first, because this is a sort of tribute to your father, wasn't it? Well, uh, in a sense, yes. And it had to, quite a bit to do with uh, curiosities I've had from the time I was very young about his service during yeah. the Second World War. It, is it true that your father, I guess, didn't talk very much about the war? Uh, he didn't talk at all about the war, uh, which, which to me was very frustrating because yeah. I was very curious about his service. Right. Um, the, the war was always of great interest to me, even from childhood. Yeah. And um, uh, he, he was not forthcoming with anything. What was he like? What, what, what was service. it like when you'd ask him about the war? What was he, what was he like? Well, the best I can describe it is by, I guess, by example. Uh, I can remember, and it's in the, it's in the film. I, met, I talk about it in the film. I can remember one day as a very young boy, I, I asked him a very insensitive question. Uh, I asked him if he had ever killed a German. Yeah. And he stood there for a minute, looked at me, square in the eye, uh, said no, and turned around and left the room. And as I say in the film, in that particular sequence, right. I knew, even as young as I was, that the truth had no place in that moment. Right. Um, and even questions that didn't involve uh, issues of that sort. Right. Uh, he just would say to me, you don't need to know that. Yeah. Um, why is that of any interest to you? Well, so what, what were you left to think when your father would be so evasive? Well, uh, I was always a very observant right. kid. And I could sense that his refusal to discuss these issues with me uh, were because he, he had no interest in reliving any of that. It was a part of his life right. that he was able to put aside, for the most part, yeah. and, and move on. You know, you're a child, and then you then you, you you're a little bit older, and your right. your interests and concerns are different. And then, yeah. as an adult, your interests and concerns are different. Right. So, that particular part of his life, he had gotten past. Yeah. The best he could. Right. Um, and and to bring it up again didn't serve any purpose. Because it wasn't in easy, his mind. It wasn't an easy time for him either, was it emotionally? No. No, not for any of those guys. Yeah. And um, now, on the other hand, I had friends whose fathers were very forthcoming with their service. Right. Um, and in many cases, I think they were as forthcoming as they were 
because they had to be. Right. It was a vent for them. Yeah. Something they had to do they to try to, to relieve, the, leave the pressure, uh, yeah. relieve the pressure up here. Yeah. Now, the, the, the fortunate aspect of my father's post-war life was that he, he was of a very, he had a very healthy mind. Okay. Uh, he was able to keep things in their place and not let one thing interfere with something else. So things are sort of compartmentalized? Yes, okay. yeah. Um, but it, I have to tell you, it was very frustrating. Uh, it, it, he just wouldn't talk to me about it. He yeah. just didn't see any need to talk to me about it. Why don't you tell me if in the midst of the enemy you tried to sleep with both eyes wide open? How well do you think those German kids slept in the dark forest of the Ardennes? I may have better understood some of your fears had we talked. It would have excited me as a young boy to talk about the M5 tank that you crewed as a member of the 750th Tank Battalion. If I hadn't stumbled upon your separation paper, your assigned unit would have remained a mystery. Having searched for and found an operable M5, I soon realized what a tin can it was and how your position in the bow had to be less than reassuring. Was there a 30 or 50 caliber machine gun mounted on the turret of your tank? And how defensible was it equipped with only a 37 millimeter main gun? How cold was it in the bowels of that tank during what I'm told was the worst Belgian winter in some 20 years? I'm not so naive as to believe you were obligated to discuss this time of your life with me. However, you must understand that if I'm made aware of those things that profoundly influenced you, I can then confidently grasp who I have become. Even within a crowd of people, there were times I would catch you very much alone. Your blank stare was transporting you to some other place. I think in those moments, you were entertaining demons. Were you? And as I got older, I found that interesting because, uh, I mean, around the, at the time I graduated high school, was the time, uh, you know, there was another war. My war was going on, right. which was Vietnam, yeah. you know? And um, we, still we never talked about it. Do you think your father's refusal to talk about the war just made you more and more interested about the war? Oh, sure, sure. And the older I got, I, I, I have to say it, it, it became uh, more important to yeah. me. More important to me. You, you have to, you have to, I, I guess, I guess the reason for that, some of the reason for that was that I've always been of the belief that because I came from him, right. the things that influenced him in his life um, ultimately were going to, were going to find their way to me. Right. So some of the little idiosyncrasies he may have had. Right. That, that may have been as a result of the war, yeah. w were going to be mine right. at some point. Yeah. You know? And I wanted to know what those influences were. And uh, I don't know, it was just fruitless effort. You know? <laughs> but well, so when did you decide to make this documentary? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, when he passed away, and how long ago was that? In 1996. Okay. Um, 
the Veterans Administration uh, informed me that he was uh, uh, eligible for burial. The government would bury him. Right. And I made the decision to do that with military honors. Um, and the day of the service, the funeral service, I said to my wife, I said, I have to, uh, I have to go to Belgium and into Germany to see the, the place that influenced this guy. Yeah. And she said, well, she said, look, you're not going to go there. The Germans are gone. You're not going to hear uh, 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 bombs and right. gunfire and uh, the tanks are gone and, you know. But if you have to, you're going to need to document it somehow. You're either going to have to keep a journal, right? Uh, take the still camera with you, or even take the little video camera, and and because it's too too important to yeah. you. So after thinking about it, and after having made the commitment mentally to go there and right. and do it, I said, "Geez, this is a great opportunity to 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 document." What, what I find, right. and what I come away with. Yeah. Uh, because this is not a situation that's unique to me. Right, I understand that, yeah. There are millions of us yeah. whose fathers and uncles and friends would not discuss any of, uh, any of that experience. Or any, any war. Or any, from yeah. any war, not right. just the Second World right. War. I mean, there was Korea and Vietnam and, right. you know, the Gulf. Or Iraq. Thing. Yeah. Iraq. Yeah. So what I did was, the research began, uh, and I was fortunate enough to have gotten my hands on the S3 journal, the after action reports. Oh, really? Okay. That, that spoke to the daily movement of his tank battalion yeah. throughout the days of the Battle of the Bulge uh, and, and a little bit into Germany. And I put a crew together and we headed to Brussels and, and basically followed the movement of his unit step by step and um, captured the footage that we needed. Yeah. Uh, I was able to gather some archival footage. And then when I came home, I sat down and I composed a letter to him, uh, which everyone thought was somewhat odd because he's passed away now. and. Who writes letters to dead people? You know, I mean, it's, but but that's what I chose to yeah. do. And in the letter, letters, I raise some of the same questions I had as a growing up, and I equate those to childhood experiences that I had. I ask those same questions. And then I tell him, if he were to return to Belgium, this is what he would see today yeah. at peace. Um, and and I, it, it was just such an uh, overwhelming experience that uh, um, I knew that toward the end of the war, he had, he had witnessed a concentration camp in Austria. Right. And I felt that that would be a... a uh, an interesting sequel to the original film. What was it like for you emotionally to write this letter, these letters? Uh, extremely difficult. Because all the time I was writing, yeah. I was so mad because I didn't feel that there was any need for me to have to do this. Because he hadn't been forthcoming? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, and all the time I was writing, I was talking to myself, saying, why is there a need to do this? There shouldn't be. Yeah. This should have been all laid out right. years ago, or through the years, you know, while he was alive. But um, uh, I didn't know any other way to do it. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, uh, I just felt that, that he and I needed to needed to resolve some things, you know, yeah. that, uh, about the war and specifically. I yeah. mean, we that was the only 
contentious part of our relationship, yeah. I think, was was his service. You know, and um, it also it also, I have to say, it was a great opportunity for me to scold him <laughs> at, a, at a time he couldn't do anything about it. You know. <laughs> So as I was writing, you know, I think you've I was, given a lot of people some ideas here. <laughs> yeah, as I was writing, I was also thinking about the the times that uh, yeah. you know I was disciplined, and yeah. uh, this was my opportunity. Yeah. You know? So have other members of your family seen the film? Oh sure. Oh yeah. So what, what, what's there been? What's been their reaction? Well, uh, I mean, they obviously knew him. They knew that he had no interest in 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 talking about it. Um, they learned a lot yeah. that they didn't know about me, about him, about our relationship, you know. Uh, my younger brother, for example, uh, he, he would see the film in, in its various stages of production. Yeah. And he would call me and he'd say, geez, I never, I never knew that about Dad, or I never yeah. knew that you felt this way or that way, you know. Do you have kids or, or nephews or nieces? Or? Um, I have, I have uh, uh, two daughters and a son. So what, what, do, they, what do they think of the, um, of the film about their grandfather? Uh, well, I, I'm not quite sure yeah. because Because I didn't have that experience, yeah. It was almost ancient history to them, right? You know, the the the, the Second World War to them, uh, although to me is recent history, right? They're another generation removed, yeah. So they watched it very intently, right? Uh, and and they were they were overwhelmed with the with the content of the film. Yeah. But their experience is, is different than mine yeah. or my brothers. You, you know. So and I and I didn't I didn't really I didn't really see a need to. Yeah. Uh, look to them for right for any uh, for the same type of interest that I had. Yeah. You know. Do you, do you think maybe there was a part of your father that wanted to talk to you about this? No, not at all. Because if there had been, he would have. Okay. He would have. Uh, he didn't have any trouble talking to me about anything. We worked together for a number of years. I was extremely close to him. And if there were things he wanted to talk about, he did it very freely. Okay. We had a great relationship mm, okay. in, that, in that regard. He just thought, this is over, this is done, I don't need to revisit it. Yeah. Okay. I just... Uh, it, it was it was very frustrating to now, me. I, now, after you made the film, after you got back from Belgium, you had to go back, didn't you? Yes, we we shot uh, quite a bit of footage uh, in May. Right. But I felt, in order to do the film justice, in order to be fair to him and to me, right, I needed to uh, uh, to to be in Belgium. In, in the winter, right when the Battle of the Bulge was fought. Yeah. So we went back in February, the following February, and, uh, and, and did some shooting. And we were very fortunate. It snowed, and it was cold and miserable. Yes, it's I cold. can't yes. tell you. I know. I've been there. Yeah. But, but I needed to do that because it would not have been fair to anyone or the film, as I said, uh, to, to, to not have experienced that right. place at that time. Right. And um, uh, so it, it I'll, I'll tell you, I, uh, it, it, it would have been, it would have been so wrong yeah. not, not to have done this. Right. Um, was there anything new that you learned about the war? while you were researching this film. This is interesting. Here's okay. what happened. A friend of mine said to me, what are you, what are you going to bother going over there for? You're not going to see anything. Uh, the, the, as my wife said to me, the Germans are gone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're not going to hear a cannon fire. 
uh, no one's going to ambush you over there. I mean, you're just not going to have the experience that he had. It's over. Yeah. But an interesting thing happened. After the war, there was a, uh, a tremendous amount of equipment, armored equipment, for example, right. that had been abandoned. Now, what happened was, if a tank, for example, had had a turret blown off and it was laying on the side of the road, the scrap dealers went in, right. cut up the sheet metal, and, and yeah. took it away. But in many of the villages in the Ardennes region of Belgium, if there was a tank, for example, yeah. that was pretty much together, maybe it had been immobilized, but it was right. together, they would take that tank and they would perch it, for example, at an intersection, and it would become a monument. Really? Okay. Now, in one particular little village over there, there is a panzer tank that has been established as a monument. And that tank sported an 88 millimeter gun. This thing had a, g a cannon on it that was that's just, I think, I think would would shoot from here to the moon. Wow! Very powerful machine. <clears throat> well, if you stand next to that tank and you're there amongst its enormity, yeah, and you look across the street to the windy road that comes through the forest right. that that tank traveled yeah. down, you, get, you can get a sense yeah. of how frightening it had to be yeah. to GIs who were positioned at that intersection, right. manning a machine gun, hearing the sound of that tank coming, and then rounding a corner and having that 88 millimeter gun pointed right at your eyes. Right. You can't, you can't imagine that simply watching a documentary on television or having someone tell you about it. Right. When you're standing there, it's a totally different experience. Yeah. Totally different. Um, so it was those types of things that, that I, gave me a better sense of what, what that had to be like. Another case was uh, the Ardennes region of Belgium is very heavily forested. Right. You cannot imagine how dark those forests are, even at noontime. Yeah. So to try to imagine being there in those forests, which I did yeah. at night, I mean, you can't see two feet in front of you. Right. Well, you, no, no one can describe that to you. And you can watch all the Discovery Channel and Military Channel and every, uh, all the documentaries on television. You, you just can't get, get, get a sense of that unless you're right there at right. that time. Right. So, so those are the things that I... Okay. I came away with, and the, the 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 talking that I was able to do with the with the villagers who were just kids at the time right. themselves, but they were there. Yeah. Um, you know, in the middle of the night, when 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 the a, a German company would come through the village yeah. and they'd throw everyone out of their houses yeah. and and uh, so that they could have a place to sleep or set yeah. up a headquarters. I mean, it was frightening because to they those have their people. own stark memories. Sure. Of this, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those are the types of things that I, uh, that, that's, a, that's as close as you're going to get to reliving what, what right. happened there. Right. For someone who wasn't there. Right. Um, and, and it would have been wrong not to, not to go and do that. I understand that. Uh, now, you did another film. Yes. Uh, Silent Quarry. Yes. Now, I think that's about a concentration camp? Yes. The, there was one aspect of my father's service that he spoke very freely to me about, but only if I asked. Okay. Uh, 
he had the unfortunate uh, experience, I guess, to witness the concentration camp in Mauthausen, yeah. Austria, right. which is in Upper Austria. It was the largest camp the Nazis maintained. Yeah. And it was a stone quarry, granite quarry. Um, so m most who were imprisoned there would, would, would quarry the stone that was yeah. there. And they would, you know, work them to death, basically, is what, what went on. Yeah. I mean, they At one point in time, there was a pressing need among the medical staff to find an antidote for lice. The prison barrack was chosen as the place to conduct the research. I doubt anyone refused to participate. As you're probably aware, all the ugliness associated with gassing, incineration, medical experimentation, and the removal of gold from the mouths of the dead took place in the bowels of these buildings. The incinerators that transformed flesh to ashes have been scrubbed clean and thus retain little evidence of their past. It's important that you know the unbearable choking odors that prevented you from making your way through the camp to the crematorium are gone. The winds that blow across this scenic hillside have taken them to other places. Don't feel deprived not having seen these. You would have felt as dirty as I did touching those death books. Upon request and for a fee, families of those from favored places and or status could receive the ashes of loved ones whose lives ended here. Touching, isn't it? As I ventured deeper into hell, I entered a room that except for the strange heavy doors gave me no cause for alarm. Until I looked up. Plumbing suspended from the ceiling gave away the room's dark secret. Now void of the shower heads that served to deceive those entering this room, any doubt about where I was standing and what transpired here quickly disappeared. Deadly Zyklon B was administered by nefarious means to all who entered this room. It was never intended to offer a comforting shower. Standing here, you not only feel dirty, you emerge feeling a little less human. I did gas some people. Um, but, but if I had any questions about that, he would answer them, albeit briefly. So he didn't really volunteer information? No, but if I asked, he would, he would tell me about it. Yeah. So... That was too important an aspect of his service not to, for me not to investigate. Right. So I decided this is a great opportunity to sequel Sons of War. So I went to Mauthausen and we shot footage at the camp, as obviously as it is today, uh, and of the village of Mauthausen which is right on the Danube River. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Um, and I came home and I composed another letter to him and I, and I, that speaks more to uh, what he, what, what, what remains of the camp. Yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting because I, I actually saw more of that camp than he did. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what, I'll, I'll relate one in, one instance to you. He, I asked him if he had, when he was there, if he had seen the in, the incinerators. Yeah. And he said no, and I was I was shocked. Right. 
And I said, what do you mean, no? And he said, well, he said, when we got out of the tanks, started to walk through the camp, he said, the, uh, uh, the odor was so bad. And there were so many bodies piled so high. Uh, he said, we just couldn't. We couldn't do it. Yeah. We just couldn't walk any further. And, and, right. uh, um, so, but I saw those incinerators. Right. You know, and uh, and and there were some other things that that he didn't see, because in order to see them, he would have ha he would had to have made his way past the incinerators to see them. Right. Um, so. And of course, as, as I said, we you know we stayed right there in the village, and we we had conversation with the people there, right. and uh, many of whom were there during the war. And uh, so it it was uh, it, it was a uh, that was not a very pleasant experience. I, I have to say, I, I thought I was very very well prepared mentally. Right. I guess you can to, never really be prepared for that. To game. shoot that film, but I, I have to tell you, it was—it's very, very depressing, very depressing. Uh, I, um, I mean, we did our work, we did what we had to, but, right. but I was happy to come home after doing that one. Yeah, real happy. In, in, fa in fact, uh, putting that film together, the editing process was just. Uh, there were times I had to just. Shut everything down because it's hard for you emotionally. Well, yeah, I mean it's it's just nasty material. I yeah. Mean, but now that film, uh, Sons of War, uh, was exhibited at the Sedona International Film Festival in right. Sedona, Arizona, a couple of years ago. Yeah. And it did extremely well. Um, it it drew emotions out of people that I don't. Really? Not sure they knew they had. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, the co-chair of the festival, who introduced the film at the second screening, uh, when the film was complete and the credits were running, she came to me and she said, "You know, uh, this is the third time I've seen this film," and she said, "It affects me more each time I see it." And she said, you also need to know that you, you've done your audiences a tremendous injustice. And I said, how's that? And she said, uh, you knew what this film was going to do to people emotionally. Yeah. And you did not provide anyone with tissues. <laughs> so now we have just submitted Silent Quarry right. uh, to the same festival. Yeah. Um, and we're waiting to hear whether or not they're going to accept it. Uh, I hope they were able to yeah. to get through it. So tell me, tell me about the editing process. What's that like for you? Well, it was exciting. I had so much material. I mean, we had Sons of War between the the footage that we shot and the still photographs that yeah. I had and the archival footage that I had. We probably I probably had gee pretty near 130 hours of. Wow. Uh, of, of uh, uh, material to go through. So the days were very long. Yeah. Um, Your wife probably didn't see very much of you. No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, I, there were days I didn't even eat. I was, you, because you get so focused on exactly. it. Exactly. And in an effort to tell the story uh, as well as you want to, you, 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 you get lost in it. I mean, you, it becomes your life. Um, but in, you have to sit and you watch hours and hours and hours of, of material, uh, tape, and try to choose appropriate still photographs so that the story gets told in a coherent manner right and I and you and you and you you also have to do it in a way that um, uh, th that that you're actually taking people for that same walk that you took right um, 
so that so that they understand that this this was a this was a a, a, a journey that was you know very well organized yeah. and, and had a path that it needed to follow yeah. you know and um, but it was it was and then you know you 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 get into uh, it was amazing to me how much beautiful footage we had that didn't apply to telling the story right and that you you have to be able to make up your mind that well it's beautiful to watch, but it doesn't lend itself well, that's to, hard, to what it? you're doing. That's oh, hard, it's terrible! It? It's terrible yeah. because you want everyone to see it. But, but, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't forward the story, right? Uh, you can't use it. Yeah, you can't use it. And there were other things. There were other things that that I had. Uh, other pieces of material that I had that were I. I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have thought anyone would ever want to look at it, but but it fit in a particular place, yeah. and it and it got the it drove home the point. Right. So you use it. Yeah. Uh, but hours and hours and hours. That film was probably uh, Sons of War was probably. Uh, gee whiz! I want to say that was. Uh, I want to say that was close to four months. Yeah. So both Editing. both films what six years in the making? A little over six, yeah. closer to seven. So even in a, even though a Silent Quarry was emotionally difficult for you, you had a, a real sense of satisfaction when you finished editing that too. Oh yeah. You? Oh yeah. 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 Because it's uh, it's it, it's interesting. Yeah. People who have seen both films. Right. I think eight out of ten people that have seen both films. Right have told me that both films belong in the schools, that kids should see these films. Uh, not grammar school. High schools? High school, yeah. high school age, and college. And college. Sounds like you're right. Um, you were talking earlier about how the editing process uh, took years away from your life. Yeah, yeah well, it seemed like it did. Yeah. Um, Look, you, you, if, you're, if you're passionate about your work, time means nothing right. when you're in the process of doing something like right. this. And you cannot, you cannot be interrupted. You know, in my case, I'm very fortunate. My wife understands me very well, and she knew how important this was to me. And, and she put no undue pressure on me yeah. at all. I mean, things that are considered my chores at home uh, became hers, and she just did it. She just took over and and, uh, and left me in my little editing suite. Yeah. And um, uh, and it's interesting if you if you I I'm of the opinion that through the editing process of of, of a film, let's say. Um, At the time, it is the only thing in your life. Now, I will have to qualify that by telling you that I'm at a very good time in my life because I didn't have any of the pressure of kids. Right. You know. Because they're grown. They're grown. Right. They're married and doing their thing. Um, for the most part, the dog was with me all the time I was doing it. He, right. He, he needs to be with me, you know. You have uh, Labradors. Yeah. 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 And, um, but you have to, I have never focused on anything as, as intently as I did these, this editing process. I mean, it was, it was, I don't know. I don't know if I can describe it to you. It was just, I, I think uh, I understand the process, uh, yeah. It's just... Uh, now, but yeah. satisfying? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you, you don't come to this... I mean, you don't come to this naturally, so... So, um, how did you... Did you you're pretty much self-taught, aren't you? Yes. So, yeah. what, what did you... How did you... How did you... How did you teach yourself? Did you watch other documentaries or buy film books? Well, or? I, I don't watch... I have never watched mindless TV, for example. So you don't watch this show very often? I, <laughs> I, 
I don't consider this mindless. <laughs> when I say mindless, okay, I don't watch. What do they call them today? Reality right. shows. I watch news. Yeah. And I watch things that I can learn from. Right. <clears throat> I always had a very keen eye. Yeah. Uh, I was always able to see angles. Yeah. And compose things uh, that I that I saw. And I had always been told that from the time I was in school that I had, I had an ability to, to write, which I never pursued right. until this. But, um, but, but I, I, have to, I have to go back to the fact that this material yeah. was important to me. Yes. And it was, and it became, it became a passion. Right. So that if I had an ability to compose shots, for example, through through the lens of a camera, and I had a little bit of ability to to write, and I could tell a story. That was a story you cared about too. And a story that was important to me. Um, it it. I mean, it wasn't anything that was painful. It wasn't, you know. Right. Uh, and, and, and I may have mentioned to you uh, before we began the interview that these these projects started for me when I was, I don't know, 53? Right. 54, maybe? Yeah. And And in the process of doing these, I found myself mentally and physically who I was at 15. Right. So uh, I've been fortunate, I guess, they have provided a rebirth to me. Yeah. You know, uh, and uh, you know, I don't, and I'm not done. Yeah. I have, we have another couple of projects that we're, Good. we're beginning production on. And now, uh, actually you did come to, the, you did come to Slate Life because you spent a lot of your, your years in the automotive business. Yeah, that was my career. I spent, gee, 38 years repairing cars, and and, uh, and it was it was it was great. I mean, it's yeah. what I wanted to do, and yeah. it, and it and it it did what it needed to do for me. Right. Uh, one of the things I did not want to do was I did not want to do a retirement. Right. A full blown retirement. You mean just do nothing? Yeah. I was fortunate enough to be able to retire when I was 53. Right. But I felt I, I, I mean, physically I felt tremendous. Yeah. And and I, I still felt that creatively there were things that I could I could do and I wanted to do. Right. And um, uh, I, I've been lucky in that sense. You know, I. I I still feel good, and I and I. It's just not time for me to uh, start rocking in, in the chair. You yeah, know? yeah. You, you for, actually, you first started with photography, didn't you? Well, w w one of the hobbies I developed yeah. actually, I have to go back to when I lived in in the Boston area, yeah. which is where I'm from right. originally. <clears throat> I had a 23 foot sport fishing boat. Okay. Beautiful boat. Yeah. Uh, not big, but it was a nice boat. And weekends in the summertime, um, my youngest daughter and I, for the most part, it was just she and I, we would take the boat. Jeez, uh, there were days we'd be 20 miles, maybe 25 miles offshore. Yeah. Uh, uh, out in Massachusetts Bay. Right. <clears throat> and we'd just cruise out there until we found. Uh, some humpback whales, and uh, we I'd shut the boat off, and we'd just drift all day with the whales. Yeah. And we had some amazing experiences out there on the water. And it provided the incentive to start doing some still photography, right. which we did. 
and uh, and then because I always had a uh, from the time I was a little kid I, I used to tell everyone including my parents right that before I died I was going to go to Africa to see that wildlife yeah for real I don't want to look at it in magazines anymore. Right. So I guess I was in my mid-40s, and I found myself in a position financially and from the standpoint of time to be able to go to Africa. So the very first trip, I brought my two daughters my wife and I, and we went to, we went to Africa, and we, we, I did a very, very private safari, and we spent 16, 16 of the most wonderful days I've ever had in my life out in the bush. Yeah. And I haven't stopped going since. I, mean, I haven't been for a few years because, because of the films, but... but uh, now, a lot of the safaris now are, are photographic safaris yes. not where we're like we old Ernest Hemingway move no, where no, no, people no. go with their long guns and shoot no, things. No, 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 not at all. And and that took the photography to to another to another level. Yeah. Um, and that's really what I guess inspired the the uh, the, the the desire to document these uh, uh, these things concerning my father, you know. And not only that, but your production company. Yep. Yeah. Is named after after an African antelope. Yeah, Kudu was an African antelope. The beautiful, just very majestic, uh, rack horns. You know? Yeah. And uh, so that's where all of this has come from, yeah. I guess. So, what are, the, what are the next projects you're working on? Well. <clears throat> Or I want I don't want to jinx them, but I mean, what what do you have in mind? I'd like to I'd like to write another letter to my father. And the project would involve traveling around the country, uh, and I and I'd like to write to him about my observations about where we are as a country yeah. today. Um, and I'd like to shoot people's homes yeah. who are displaying the flag. Yeah. And uh, just talk to him about where I think we are as a country today yeah. and, and, and what, what, talk to him a little bit about whether or not he'd be okay with it, you know. Uh, uh, you know the fact that we're still fighting in a couple of places, and uh, uh, I'm not a very political guy. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't. It's not going to be a um, politically motivated film. Right. Uh, but I, I, that project actually, we've already started production. Okay. Uh, and it. It's going to take what we're doing is we're going to split the country up into regions and okay. and and um, and then I have a, a project that I want to do in Africa. Okay. Uh, th that won't have anything to do with him or any discussion between me and him. It's that's yeah, a totally different. Just one of your thing. deep passions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, before we go, I want to talk. Uh, you did a, a benefit recently for the Wounded Warrior Project. Yes. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Well, Wounded Warrior Project, if you're not familiar with it, um, is an organization that provides uh, aid and support, guidance, to the kids who are coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan with issues yeah. that they didn't leave home with. Right. Some of them physical, some of them mental, maybe both. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's a situation, or I see it as a situation where the, you know, the government, the government is, is obligated to them. Post-war, right? But but only to a 
point, I guess. And then it seems as though they get kind of dropped off at, on the corner. Lost and, in the system, yeah. And it's, you know, uh, they have to fend for themselves. Okay. And in uh, doing that, I, I would imagine for, a, for someone who's had that traumatic an experience can be difficult. Yeah, devastating. Uh, again, I've never experienced it, but I, I can I think only we all imagine. know people have. Uh, and I'll tell you, it, it, I say that because after having done these two films, yeah. even though I haven't had the experience, in a sense I have. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to that, and, uh, and I just felt that the, the two films uh, were a, uh, a, a good means to, to, to do some good with them, okay. you know, while we're in the process of trying to find distribution and licensing and, and okay. things, you know. So. All right. So that's what we did. Great. Well, Douglas, I want to thank you very much for being on the show oh, today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank all right. you. All right. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next week. Hi, my name is Ike Mills. I'm with the American Postal Workers Union number 667 out of Fayetteville Local. And we're watching Fayetteville Local Access TV. They say that when you're facing extreme danger, your life flashes before you. If you think that's sad, consider facing it before you even have enough life to flash before your eyes. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Deaths and injuries can be prevented by using the right car seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to know what is appropriate for each age and size.